sort of role play game where you take over a country and you just kind of do what you need to do or what you think is right so you are my enslavement my freedom you are my flesh burning like a raw summer night you are my country nazim hikmet ron Nineteen oh eight, Kingdom of Swordland. You opened your eyes to this world. You came from a wealthy family in the city of Lochvin, a middle income family in the city of Holzard, an impoverished family in the city of Dare. I'm gonna do a wealthy family this time, just to see how that goes. Your parents named you Anton. As the only child of a successful businessman, you had the chance to grow up in a wealthy family. Life was easy at first and you had the best education money could afford. However, things inside the Rain family changed due to the absence of your father. This affected your mother and you negatively. The years passed. September 9th, 1923. During a history class at school, the bell started to ring unexpectedly. You heard a loud commotion outside. As everyone tried to figure out what was going on, the principal announced the historic revolution. The kingdom was no more. The Republic of Swordland was born. I was just happy I had the day off. After graduating, you passed the university exams with high marks. You had the opportunity to choose between several studies. You chose economics at the Lochvin Business School. During the first year, you attended a lecture with David Whiskey. I'm guessing that's how you pronounce it. I could be pronouncing it wrong. He was a well-known diplomat from the Foreign Ministry and the son of the President. After observing the hall in silence, he explained why a market economy is the better option for Swordland. He argued for a system where prices for goods and services are determined by the open market. I agree with that, so I agreed in principle. Soldiers entered the campus in the evening ahead of the first election. Many were in shock as the uniform of the men created a security cordon and started arresting the teachers. A group of students started gathering and protest along with your best friend, Peter Vector, and you decided to protest with the students. My best friend's doing it. You know my gun ass is doing it. Well, the officers made a loud announcement that echoed through the campus. General Ludren declared martial law and order to restore the administration. Please stand back and disperse to your rooms. You joined the students and suddenly marched towards a large group of soldiers. Suddenly, the soldiers charged. The student fell and was trampled as everybody started running away. I'm gonna hold my ground. The soldiers beat you relentlessly. It was a gloomy year. The majority of the students and teachers displayed their opposition. Thus, hold on, I might need to. Yeah. I feel like that might have been just a wee bit loud. Let's see. That should take care of it. The majority of the students and teachers displayed their opposition. Thus, Lockman became a target for the military regime. You didn't want to stay idle and decided to join the student council. The council is focused on increasing student involvement in the campus along with partaking in the budget. Through active participation, you gained budget management and leadership skills. One of the meetings, Peter introduced... Peter introduced you to one of his friends, Monica, who was a volunteer for the Swordish League of Women. You were immediately attracted to her diligence. The politically charged environment led you to stay away from any political organization, because fuck that. The radio relayed that the communist general Ricard surrounded the Lutheran and his troops demanding their surrender. They refused and heavy fighting broke out across the country. You just couldn't believe it. The army was fighting among themselves. Amongst themselves. Swordland plunged into chaos. The clashes escalated into a full blown civil war. The horrors made you isolate yourself for a while. Monica helped you cope and love grew between the two of you. However, it was a difficult time for love. The chaos must end. Nineteen twenty nine, Republic of Swordland. The charismatic colonel, Tarkin Sol, orchestrated a sudden coup and brought an end to the chaos. He wrote a new constitution and restored stability. The people saw him as a savior. 
He formed the United Swordland Party and ran as a presidential candidate in the first ever elections. You voted for the United Swordland Party. USP won the election by a large majority. After graduation, you kept seeing Monica and noticed her interest to marry. However, a letter arrived from the military calling you to fulfill your compulsory service. It's time to serve your national duty. February 1930, Bergia region. A devastating civil war broke out in the neighboring country, Wayland. That distinguished major, uh, I think that's... Osef? I, I Osef? I don't know. Butchering the name once again. Guys, guy, give me a break. Isof Lancia ordered you to lead your squad on a border patrol mission. It was a very cold winter night when you began marching out of Gumren outpost. You could see your breath. After several hours of marching through the snowy hills, distant noises were heard. Visibility was too low to confirm the source. To confirm the source, the squad crawled forward in formation and found a spot to observe. A group of refugees and maybe on the border fence you escorted them back, of course. The refugees were in despair when they realized that you were taking them back to the border. Screams and protests ensued as they were restrained. You delivered them to the border guards. After several months of military service, your duties ended and you went back to civilian life. You and Monica decided to share your lives together after receiving the blessings of her parents. A ceremony was held in Holzard. During the same year, you were offered a high-paying job at the governing United Swordland Party. It was important to start your career on a good foot, so you accepted it. Working for the ruling party was the easiest path to power. You became the economics assistant to one of the more experienced members of the assembly. You worked long and hard, staying late at work, investigating hundreds of pages of economic reports. You were climbing the ladder. September 1933. Seoul strengthened the Republic by removing the institutions and symbols of the former kingdom from society. Things were also looking up for the country as the massive economic boom continued and people were the happiest they had been in a decade. Election time came and it was decided. President Tarkin Seoul was elected once more. The new five-year plan and the sub subsequent working... Wor <laughs> words hard, I apologize. The new five-year plan and the subsequent work regarding finance put you under a lot of pressure. But your significant contribution to the economic strategy triggered an invitation to meet President Tarkin Sol himself, who offered you a key position. You were to become the youngest member of the assembly. You accepted with doubts. I'm a little kid. Like I, I'm probably like a teenager, early 20s. This is crazy. As the youngest MP, it was difficult to connect with the influential inner circle. You needed allies, so you brought Peter as your right-hand man. The birth of your son, Frank, provided a brief moment to join early few. Sacrifice family to improve your position in the party, sadly. Just like your father once did to you, you prioritized work over family along with Peter. You accomplished great things in the party. At home, Monica and Frank fill your absence. Meanwhile, President Sol increased his authority over the years. His growing ego started to cause strife within the party. The cracks began to show. President Seoul barely secured a majority in the election against the opposition leader. Over the past year, people were growing discontent with corruption and the worsening quality of life. Meanwhile, calls for a United Swordland Party Congress became louder as a leadership struggle started to brew. You kept supporting the president. The contender for party leadership was Ewald Alfonso, reformist and talented business magnate with a growing popularity within the party. You were trying to secure votes for President Sol who noticed your loyalty and approached you with a lucrative deal. You had a meeting with him. The president offered you the position of Minister of Economy, Commerce, and Energy in the next government if you backed him in the upcoming voting. I accepted. The party congress was nothing short of impressive. The banners of United Swordland were decorating every possible spot. Thousands of influential political figures, lobbyists, and benefactors gathered for this turning point. The voting for the party leadership began. I voted for Tarkin Sol. Fortunately, Sol lost the leadership vote to Uwald Alfonso with a small margin. During the Congress, Sol announced his retirement from politics. The system, had the system he had established were to stay much longer. His achievements wouldn't be forgotten. You 
were troubled by the departure of Seoul. He brought change to this country, man. What can I say? A month later, your daughter was born. Monica named her Deanna. She motivated you during a tumultuous period in the party. The general elections were approaching. The United Soviet Party was under the new leadership of Ewald Alfonso Yu. Joined the party efforts and campaigned for him. During the general elections, the main opposition the main opposition leader was embroiled in a sex scandal with his secretary, diminishing their chances. The extensive privatization program proposed by Ewald Alfonso secured an election victory for the United Swordland Party. Over the next years, you dedicated yourself to, no, do, tried all that was necessary to climb up the ladder. The presidency of Ewald Alfonso saw many bold reforms, but was followed by a serious economic recession. recession. The other parties announced their bid for the 1953 election, but the unfair system hampered all opposition efforts to win you. Thought that your party could not survive another crisis, were worried about the economic recession, worried that your reputation would be tarnished along with Alfonso. <clears throat> Together with Peter, your presence in the USP grew and you became the face of a new wing in the party. You effectively took over the leadership as President Alfonso lost control of the country. The moment to make a move had come. You blamed Alfonso for the crisis on television. Now I'm going to advise Alfonso to step down. He didn't take your advice seriously and started to reshuffle his cabinet, but most of his inner circle abandoned him. Your diplomatic attitude made the party vote you in as a leader. Following this, you announced that you would be running for president in the general election, with Peter as your running mate. It was your turn. After visiting every city and town during the campaign, you made a speech on state television. You promised to enact democratic reforms. The people are tired of empty promises. We need fundamental change in our institutions and government. A solid and transparent democracy awaits us. Brothers and sisters, a new constitution and a new age is upon us. The broadcast ended. On election day, millions are now to cast their votes. It's time to face the truth. Chapter 1. President Reign. Dropping stuff off my desk. God, I love it. Ow. And bumping my knees on desk, I guess that's part of it too. Hairstyle. Very prominent figure. Sortist. Attire. Swordland first. Accessories. I think that looks good to me, boys. Alright. You will not be able to change how President Rain looks from this point forward. Are you sure? Yes. Promote a free market. Diplomacy, we want to focus on the West. Um, Bold issues like the Mongolian immigrants fought to Seoul and due to relaxed immigration laws enacted by Ewald Alfonso. As a result, tensions between swords and immigrants have been increasing. Keep immigration relaxed. We want to focus. Increased crime is pushing law enforcement to their limits. While judges at court deal with that. Since the 1940s, the difference is service. Okay. Before I start looking at those, let's read this. We have also promised to focus on a certain extensive subject within our first term. The people expect us to solve the negative situations within this topic while providing an overall improvement to the related policies. So, health. 
Since the 1940s, the difference in service quality between urban and rural hospitals has been getting increasingly worse, and the average life expectancy has dropped significantly. Education. The lack of schools, teachers, and even classroom equipment in certain areas causes massive gaps in the previously robust education system. Law and enforcement. Increased crime is pushing law enforcement to their limits, while judges at courts deal with a huge and expanding backlog of legal cases. Military. The military protects the country from hostile threats, and while some see it as a massive financial burden, others argue it is a critical deterrent. I have to agree with them. It is a critical deterrent that we all need. Your promises will be remembered, and they will have consequences. Are you sure about your decisions? Yes. Two weeks have passed since we won the election, and now I was about to be sworn in as the fourth president of Swordland. Thousands were watching the inauguration ceremony and cheering my name, Anton Rain. The die was cast, and there my story began. In the distance, the Maroon Palace stood on top of the famous Hill of Pride. I had no way of knowing what future awaited me there. I looked at my family, my son and daughter, Frank and Deanna, where next to were next to Monica, my wife. Her eyes were glimmering with pride. Then I turned towards the key people who made it all possible. Of course, e of course, each individual was promised an important position in my cabinet. As my thoughts slowly faded away, the reality of the situation dawned on me. Orso Hawker, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, was waiting for me. The time for the oath has come. It has indeed. Please repeat after me, I do solemnly swear, I do solemnly swear that I will respectfully execute the office of the President of Swordland, and to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend, and to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the people and the Constitution of the Republic of Swordland. You may now deliver your inauguration speech, Mr. President. It is an honor, sir. Dear citizens of Swordland, the crowd looked very eager to listen to me. We are enduring economic hardship like never before, and today our nation is falling apart. Our people, we suffer in this dire situation. Our workers are no less productive than a decade ago. Our capable minds are no less inventive. Our products and services no less requested than they were last week, last month, or last year. The future awaits us. It's time to turn our faces to the West. It's time for United and Powerful Swordland once again. Hundreds of thousands cheered. They were shouting my name in unison. I felt the responsibility, the power, and the burden all at the same time. I waved at the crowd, which made the crowd cheer louder. I took a long look at the people of Swordland to burn this moment into my memory. One of the presidential guards came by to notify that it was time to leave. I made my way to the leading car in the motorcade. The presidential state car was a jet black Cadilla with flags of Swordland above the front headlights. Next to it, a man was holding the door. Hello, Mr. President. Still under the effects of the speech I made, hearing my new title made me smile. If you allow me to introduce myself, I am Sergey, your new driver. It's a pleasure. The pleasure is all but mine. He respectfully bowed his head before opening the car door and gesturing inside. I entered the car. We will be heading towards the palace. The motorcade began to move. On the way, Sergei proceeded to explain his duties as a driver. As minutes passed by, I found myself lost in thoughts again, barely paying attention to what he was saying. He suddenly made a gesture towards the now closer palace. Isn't it a beauty, the maroon palace? He was right. Sunlight glinted off the palace's many maroon-colored domes. It was so bright that I had to look away. Every time I look at it, I am reminded of my duty to this nation.
So do I, Sergei. It is the beating heart of the nation, after all. Well said, Mr. President. The car drove past the majestic gates, continued uphill to the entrance, and stopped in front of the doors. Sergei got out of the car and opened the door for me. Sergei Wolkner. Have a great day, Mr. President. A Mordna West Corps. He referred to the famous swordish phrase from the time of revolution, a magno est cor vector insista, which meant morning will come, victory is close. Vector insista. I made my way upstairs through the extravagant corridors of the palace. Marble and engraved wooden finishes decorated the interior. My footsteps echoed in the colossal halls. The guards bowed their heads in respect as I opened the massive doors to my new office. And the time has come. Rain emphasized Swordland's dire situation. President Anton Rain has been sworn into duty in a great ceremony in Holsard. Thousands have attended the ceremony where President Rain has met with his supporters for the first time after his election. In his inauguration, Rain spoke about the current dire situation, bringing focus on the suffering of Swordish people. We are enduring economic hardship like never before, and today our nation is falling apart," said the new president before he went on to start his first day in the Maroon Palace. President Anton Rain. The president has been sworn into office by the Chief Justice Orso Hawker, another great win for the USP in Anton Rain, who managed to get 37% of the general vote. The first congratulations came from Kassaro Kibner of the National Front Party the runner-up of the general vote. The PFJP didn't concede until the last minute, despite clear results just hours into the election. Thousands of supporters have gathered in the streets of Holstert, chanting campaign slogans, waving flags, and displaying USP party banners to display unwavering support to the newly elected president. The public mood is very positive in the capital from all accounts on the ground. The city is celebrating that a lock winner has become president of Swordland. This is the Lachvin Times. The new assembly begins duty. President Anton Rain has been elected fourth president of Swordland in the seventh Swordish elections. The United Swordland Party has won the election on Sunday with just over 37% of the vote, while Frank Richter, the leader of the People's Freedom and Justice Party, could gain just over 20%. Kassaro Kibner, the head of the right-wing National Front Party, is in third place with just over 11%. The Communist Party of Swordland and the Workers' Party of Bludia both won just below 10% of the vote, failing to pass the 10% election threshold. The new term begins with the opposition of PFJP and NFP under the USP government. The unrepresented votes below the threshold resulted in the USP taking 52% of the seats in the Grand National Assembly, giving them the lawmaking power. The new seat numbers have been finalized as follows, USP 130, PFJP 70, NFP 40, and Independence is 10. Radical, another USP president. How many times will people fall for the same trap? We've seen this before with Colonel Saul, who supposedly saved this country and brought stability in times of chaos. His stability, however, meant a life of oppression. Any opposing voices were silenced, and many were persecuted. Next, uh, next was Alfonso, who was elected as a liberal reformer to bring change to the USP in Swordland. Seeing his unfortunate inability, his own cabinet resigned. As the third USP candidate becomes president, it is high time to realize that real change won't come from their party. Restructure the infrastructure. After the recent successful mega infrastructure projects from United Katana and Vagsland, Vagsland, the world is warming up to the ideas, to the idea as a source of growth and employment. But is there any truth to this success? I guess. That's, those are long things. Let's just jump right into it. Low production at Ag Agnoland. The report calls attention to the alarmingly low levels of productivity productivity growth in the region of Agnoland, where there are also high rates of food insecurity, malnutrition, and rural poverty, rural poverty in the inner parts of the region. 
Lack of investment. The mayor of Arbury, Eric Neal, reports a lack of adequate infrastructure around Arbury, which seriously undermines the attractiveness of Arbury's investment climate. Foreign investors, particularly from Magnolia, are becoming hesitant to invest in the city. Meanwhile, according to the data published by the National Business Council, around 19% of a company's total expenditures in Agland is absorbed by, logistical, by logistics costs, while in peer region, regions, this figure is below 10%. Congratulations from President Smolak. Congratulations from President Smolak. President Smol Smolak sent his congratulations on the election victory and wished for a cooperative future between Leyland and Swordland, signaling a desire to normalize the diplomatic situation between the two countries. Read the report from Lesbia. Congratulations from Prime Minister Alvarez. Prime Minister Alvarez congratulated you for the results and spoke about his hopes to have a beneficial partnership deal in the future. He sent his best wishes to his Swordish people and warned us about the threats of the encroaching Melanavist influence of United Katana from the East, emphasizing the importance of unity in our continent, Mercopa. Republic of Swordland. Congratulations from Chancellor Hegel. Chancellor Hegel sent his congratulations on your great victory and wished for close cooperation between our countries in the future. Hegel signaled concessions from Vogsland in case of a promising trade deal. He also congratulated the Swordish democracy for the successful elections and warned us about the threat Arcasia's growing influence poses for Eastern Mercopa. Here's Agnolia. Congratulations from Prime Minister Van Horten. Prime Minister Van Horten congratulated us on our election and praised our party's stance on just and transparent elections. He signaled his wishes to continue the trade partnership between our countries as equal partners as opposed to earlier trade deals which he believes gave Swordland unfair advantage. Port of Lochvin loses importance. Port of Lochvin loses importance. The, last mer the latest marine traffic reports show that the Port of Lochvin is no longer the busiest of the Maricopa continent, falling behind to the third position. While this is a negative indicator for our administration, Lochvin still has the potential to shine. Still has the potential to shine again as a major trading center. Port of Lochvin is the largest port of Swordland and holds enormous, enormous importance for the economy, particularly as the main distribution center for linking the capital and the inner parts of Swordland to the rest of the world. The major port city will hopefully keep supporting a possible economic upturn in the entire country if investment projects succeed. Uh. Subject logistical issues. The mayor of Holster reports that the rising population and fast urban expansion has resulted in high levels of congestion in the city traffic. The logistics report underlines increased traffic and slow transportation routes is the biggest problem of the capital. The mayor also reported that the absence of a well-designed, large land-based logistics center where all transporters come together is one of the greatest problems for domestic transporters. Because Holzard is a big metropolis, transporters are scattered all over Holzard, having established such centers in 10 different districts. Read the report. <coughs> General Staff Gathers. General Staff convened right after the election to congratulate our victory. All branches of the Swordish Armed Forces were represented in the meeting that took place at Camp stronger with massive security measures. The Chief of the Armed Forces, 
Valken Kruger made a public press statement highlighting the increasing chances of military confrontation in East Maricopa and thanked us for the promise to strengthen and support the military. Briefing on the current political situation. Peter Vector arrived a couple of minutes early and sat across from me. He was struggling to hold back his smile. We did it, Anton. We won. Finally. All those years with our noses to the grindstone paid off. Peter's eyes sparkled. The strain of the past months had put a damper on his usual rackish charm. But today, he was looking and acting more like his old self. He loosened his tie and undid the top two buttons of his shirt. Enjoying the new secretary I picked out for you? Thought you'd appreciate her gorgeous set of... talents. It's a shame the rest of your staff aren't as easy on the eyes. He gestured to the slight punch that protruded over his waistband. But, hey, back in university, did you ever imagine we would be sitting here in the Maroon Palace? We have to celebrate this great victory. We will celebrate at the inaugural ball, just hang in there until the evening. Looking forward to it, Evelyn hopes to congratulate you in person there. I'm sure the kids would love to see their Uncle Peter for the first time as the Vice President. That is great to hear. It's crazy how fast the two have grown up. You are a good father. Peter had a wistful look in his eye. He and Evelyn had never been able to have kids of their own. During our campaign, the opposition had floated the rumor that he'd fathered illegitimate children during his wilder years, but it had never been substantiated. Door swung open and Lucian Gallade, my chief strategist, walked in. He was a compact man with sharp, bird-like features. After briefly surveying the room from wall to wall, he sat down, poured a glass of water, and opened his briefcase in a series of quick, graceful movements. Gentlemen, the tall case clock in the room struck three o'clock. Damn, you're you are exactly on time. Hello, Peter. Lucian then turned towards me. He very slightly bowed his head. Glad to see you, Lucian. It's a privilege to be here, sir. Lucian spoke in soft, clipped tones that immediately drew your attention towards what he had to say. Peter and I waited for him to proceed. Let's start by evaluating our current situation. The majority of the Swordish people demand change. They are more concerned about the economy than the Constitution, but they blame the system for their problems. assume that didn't matter. The majority of the, uh, yeah, system for their problems. People are losing their trust in our democracy. Why do you think radicals like Bernard Sikoris are becoming more popular? Everyone's expecting us to bring the change the last government did not. Friends Richter, leader of the reformists, believes that the true change can only be accomplished by transferring some of our powers to the assembly. I will move into the details of their demands shortly. We need we need to listen to the people if we want to serve this country. I agree with the reformists, our responsibilities to democratize our broken system. We lose, if we lose power, we won't be able to execute the changes we need to make for the good of the country. We need to listen to them. That is the best way to go. That's a There's nothing going on. That's exactly what we campaign for, a true change that will move the country forward. We will need many allies against the old guard and the government. Mr. Richter managed to persuade many members of assembly to give their support for drafting a new constitution. Reformist politicians are quickly, are quickly increasing in number. While the reformist wing inside our party is still a minority, they could have a tripartisan majority in the assembly, especially if they unite under Friends Richter. The USP reformists aren't wrong to agree that we need change, but we should be in charge. Mr. Richter could be a potential ally in our goal to maintain a majority in, this, in the assembly. Our party must fall in line with our position. He's definitely a key in this. 
reformist demands are clear. They want to limit the president's veto powers, ensure that the Supreme Court is independent, and take away the court's right to vote on constitutional amendments. We must listen to our demands, otherwise we are no different than the previous administrations. I agree, we can't ignore the winds of change, after all. The old guard will do its best to preserve the Constitution. Chief Justice Hawker and his allied judges have a great influence over the Supreme Court, which will be tough to break. The court also has the final say over constitutional, constitutional legislation. Without their approval, we cannot even change it. We must, we must break the power of the Supreme Court one way or another. I'd rather not go against them, the risks are too high. I think this one, the top option, is the best one for us. We'll need a comprehensive bill to balance the power structure more fairly. We'll need a comprehensive bill to balance the power structure more fairly. Peter Vectorin, I agree. The old guard won't like this, so a comprehensive reform that would make the reformists happy would mean maintaining a balance between all branches of government, which means removing your absolute veto as well. The reformists demand that all loopholes in the Constitution are closed. We can't underestimate this situation. We can figure it out. Our party still holds 130 out of 250 seats in the Assembly. We've got the power. However, to reform the Constitution, we must receive a two-thirds majority in the Grand National Assembly, which is 166 votes, and a simple majority in the Supreme Court that equates to six votes. After we have settled on how to proceed, we will start. We will need to talk. We will need to talk with our party figures. Our first goal must be to get the 150 signatures needed to start the process. Following the green light from the USP, we will reach out to the other party leaders to see if they would back our draft. The last step is to convince the justices of the court. The entire process will take a long time, but we must start working with the reform committee to evaluate all possibilities for a new constitution as soon as possible. The new constitution should give the president wide-ranging powers to lead so the lead of the future. We could work with the old guard to protect our, exi our existing extensive powers. We will write a more democratic constitution with the reformists. That's what we've been preparing for internally. Don't forget that promise is what got us elected. The key thing here will be strengthening the power of the assembly, which we already lead with the majority. Peter nodded and agreed. Yes, the divisions of power need to be rebalanced for a better sword line. According to the initial draft we made with the reformist, there are two changes to the constitution that are not open for their discussion. Lucian opened his dossier. First, the Supreme Court will no longer vote on constitutional amendments. Second, the president's absolute veto will be taken away. This can be replaced with a limited veto system by fixing the current loopholes. I'd have no problem with these clauses. Let's work with the reformist. Yes, sir. Lucian nodded. We will form a reform committee together with all parties and start reaching out to all the stakeholders in the assembly and the court for a new constitution. <sighs> By later in the year, we should have an idea of the reform contents and what the other parties want. Lucian took notes. Another important point we must be aware of, the Lothberg Group, the oil garks convene under this organization to influence economic policies. Conrath led it for a long time before falling ill. The new leader is Mr. Walter Tusk. Some members of the National Business Council are in their pockets. Tusk and the group will surely try to bribe us in exchange for special economic protection. I won't be bought, it won't happen. We won't let these privileged greedy snobby capitalists run this country. Alfonso said the same thing. I doubt there was anybody else to turn to in his case. Lucian looked at Peter. As far as I know, Marcel Crotoni has some strong ties to this group. His influence could definitely be an asset for us, but I'm sure he'll want something in return. The group's influence is an important force, one that we should use to our administration's advantage. The group is dependent on our economic policies. They can't move a finger without us. I wouldn't be so optimistic. The capital they represent could do a lot of damage if it was diverted. 
We need to tread carefully on all sides with all power players to survive our term. I need to underline the seriousness of the situation. Our election campaign promised to focus on the military. This was a safe choice. The military and the general staff are a powerful element in the state, and as, and as history tells us, a dangerous one too. Swordish armed forces represent our pride as a nation and will be funded as promised. That will ensure they will be on our side unless we do something drastic in the course of our term. Defense Minister oh, is more well to us compared to General Kruger, a fact that obviously can change with our actions. Either way, I see a potential rift between the two since they are clearly of different minds. If we act strongly against the military, both of those guys will unite against us. I agree with Lucian. We need to tread carefully here. Lucian looked at his watch. Well then, gentlemen, precisely 30 minutes. This concludes our political briefing for today. Our next meeting will be about our media strategy. Talk to you soon, sir. I will keep in touch. See you both at the next meeting. Lucian and Peter bid their farewells and left. Country Overview. So, Reform Committee. Reform Committee has been formed to discuss the possibilities of a new constitution with all parties in the government. Here's my cabinet where I have my vice president, chief strategist, the minister of defense and security, minister of justice and law. Yeah, there's quite a few here. Factions, legislative, grand national assembly, leaders of the assembly. Judiciary committee, which we have three reformists, three centrists, and then we have our notes here. Increasing homelessness. The region of Bergia is among the worst hit regions in Swordland where homelessness has skyrocketed since the economic recession. The number of homelessness in the city of Day is more likely to have increased by 25% last year. The rise was particularly stark among Ludish people where homelessness increased by 72% in just six years. It is reported that homelessness among ethnic minorities has reached the highest level in more than a decade. The Ludish minority of the region now account for up to 47% of all homeless people there. Gotta keep that in mind. Public opinion report. People's views on the need for democratic reform in the government structures changed over the last decade. Reformist propaganda from the leader of the People's Freedom and Justice Party, Friends Richter, have resulted in a massive increase in the demands for democratic reforms. It is estimated that currently 55% of the population supports the reformist ideas. Meeting on the media strategy. Lucian and Peter arrived at Mox to talk about recent developments in the media strategy. They both took their seats across from me. Lucian put on his reading glasses and quickly went over some documents. Peter turned to Lucian and nodded. Let's begin. First of all, Lucian, you mentioned that Marcel Cretoni contacted you. The Cretonis had always been known as one of the richest and most influential families in Swordland. Marcel Caronti was no exception. He was the oldest son of Conrath Caronti, the industrialist and media mogul who founded HOS, the richest man in the entirety of Swordland. Lucian turned to me. He has offered to meet with you, Mr. President. Why is Conrath sending his son? He, uh, unfortunately passed away today. After the passing of his father, may he rest in peace, Marcel aims to become the next CEO of the HOS Congo Moretti. I don't know how to pronounce that, so I apologize. He mentioned a productive collaboration. They are a powerful and influential media Congo, Congo Moretti to start with. They own the Swordland Today newspaper, the Swordish Broadcasting Corporation, the which means it would be wise to have them by our side. Sorry for interrupting. What does this... Uh, let's consider our options first. No need to be hasty. I agree, we need to be careful. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves first. We need to determine our general approach to the media. I'm no media expert, but Lucian made some very interesting arguments at the preparation meeting yesterday. There are two ways we can approach the media. One of them is by influencing it, which has clear advantages. The other one is keeping it independent. 
media must be independent. Ideally, yes, but an unpopular leader will not be able to pass even the easiest reforms. It is of the utmost importance to maintain public popularity and avoid any damaging scandals or mistakes. I must stress one thing, Mr. President. The more people we have supporting our agenda, the more we can accomplish. With someone on our side in an influential media organization, we can do this very easily. I see what you are getting at. I agree with Lucian, but why the assumption there will be scandals and mistakes? We can always hope for the best, but we, do we really think that nothing can go wrong, especially considering the very recent history of Swordland? Two knocks were heard on the door. Please, come in. Lady Asunio, my new secretary, entered the office. Her dark curls bounced as she crossed the room to my desk. She spoke with a slight willet in her voice. Excuse me, Mr. President. Mr. Gallade's secretary has been calling me and wanted me to relay a message. Marcel Caronti, the new CEO for HLS Conglomerat, is on the line for Mr. Gallade. Well, the ball is in our court now. Would you like to talk to him, sir? Would you like me to? You go ahead. You go ahead. Connect the line to my office. Right away, sir. Connect and call to line one. Livia left the room and the phone started ringing. Lucian picked up the phone and started to listen. A few minutes passed as the two talked over the phone. Good news indeed. Congratulations, Mr. Peronti. Thank you for contacting me about this. We will talk later. Lucian puts the phone down. What was so important that I couldn't wait? He was just elected CEO by the board of directors. He offered a partnership deal regarding his media branch. He is inviting us to his resort near Conriad for a meeting. The board has decided rather quickly. It seems that gave him the confidence to approach us again. He is going to offer a real deal and now has the power of the Congro Congo Marat too. The choice is up to you, Mr. President. I can set the meeting soon. I would like to hear your opinion, Peter. I have to say I'm torn. If he has become the CEO, then he has enormous influence now. On the other hand, do we want to privately meet with someone we don't fully know? The meeting would help us figure him out. We could still say no to whatever he offers. Arrange the meeting with Mr. Peronti. I'll set things up right away. Expect a worthwhile meeting next month. It's settled then. Looking forward to next month, I wonder if he has a pool. Lucian looked at his watch. It appears we're done for today. We will continue where we left off later. Thank you for your time. Good work, Marcel. All right, see you soon, gentlemen. Lucian and Peter gathered their documents and promptly left my office. We were already getting the attention of key figures and potentially dangerous ones, too. Sign or veto the electoral campaign finance bill. I'm going to veto that one. President vetoes bill. The campaign finance bill has been voted by President has been vetoed by President Reign after its approval from the Grand National Assembly by majority vote on Friday, following a three hour debate. Reigns Richter, who also objected to the funding package, says it contained too much unfairness in the allocation of the budget, also sought to delay proceedings by demanding a formal recorded vote but was overruled. The bill passed the assembly but failed to become law by President Reagan's decision. Congress Grounty passes away. We already learned about that. Support assembly grows for campaign finance bill. Radical unfair campaign finance bill crushed. A new bill that further expanded on the unfairness of our election system has been approved by the Grand National Assembly and was later vetoed by President Reagan. Rain deserves credit for crushing the undemocratic proposal, even though it came from his own party and would have benefited himself. The bill sought to change the rules of eligibility of the public funds that are reserved for every political party in Swordland. It eliminates every party from eligibility to the funds, apart from the three that are currently in the assembly. The insane proposal would have resulted in the governing United Swordland Party share from the funds to double. Luckily, President Range showed us that he can go against his own party when it needs to be done. Swordland's regional trade and Rumberg coming south. Yep. Party committee report. The Reform Committee Party. The Reform Committee reports that any potential changes to the Constitution in the direction of the reformists will likely result in strong opposition from the National Front Party. 
The members of assembly in support of such direction seem to be in great numbers and possibly make up majority in the Grand National Assembly, while most members of the United Southern Party seem reluctant about supporting such changes. Briefing on the current economic situation. Simon Hall, Gus Magner, and Willis Graff were about to arrive at the White Room for our scheduled economic meeting. This was the room in the Maroon Palace where all the important meetings were held. Two assistants arrived first carrying a heavy projector. They stood with it by the door waiting for the minister's to enter. From the hallway I heard Lilith Graff's voice. She was using the patient, almost motherly tone she often took in heated arguments. Lilith Graff, Gus, do you really think that such an economical advanced area is more in need of investment than Agnoland? Willis, my interior minister, strode in. She was clad in shades of brown and beige. The only spot of color, a bright yellow nearest star on her necklace. Gus followed close behind. Don't be an idiot, Willis. What about the unemployment crisis and the great Holsard and Gwesland regions are going through? These are our economic heartland. Gus curled his hands into a fist. The minister of agriculture and rural development's temper hadn't changed since his days in the Alfonso administration, but neither had his reputation for getting things done. His far-reaching network of connections was unlike any other. Simon Hall quickly stepped between the two ministers. Without looking at either of them, he cleared his throat. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I am very well and motivated, Mr. Rain. It seems their ministers are feeling the same. Just as expected. How's it going, Willis? Just as expected of my cabinet. How's it going, Gus and Willis? It's looking good, sir, although there seems to be a lot of work that requires attention, especially about lifting people out of poverty, certainly a challenge. I am feeling fairly confident about the current state of affairs. We've already begun restructuring local governments and introducing new safety measures off to a good start. If there's anything you need help with, reach out to me. Good, I am confident in your abilities. That is appreciated. We will not disappoint you. Thank you, Mr. President. Now I would like to show you the latest economic situation. Simon pulled a silk handkerchief out of his pocket and briefly wiped his glasses. Simon Hall, my staff and I have comprehensively analyzed every aspect of... He is interrupted by a groan from one of the assistants by a door, both whom are now visibly struggling to hold up the heavy projector. Oh, you can put that there. He pointed below the painting of President Saul. The assistants placed the projector next to the table and installed a white screen on the wall. <clears throat> leave now. I mean, thank you, and please leave now. The assistants left the cabinet room. I was reminded that Simon had never quite had a way with people, but his facility with numbers had made him the most sought-after economic specialist in Swordland. Simon started looking for his slides. He always carried documentation around with him. Willis leaned to the table and spoke. Simon, what happened to the new police station construction in Estort? While going through his briefcase, he paused for a moment to answer. It got stalled due to a government poverty or a government property boundary issue. I've been meaning to take a look at it. I can take a look at that one. Estort needs all the security help it can get. Sure, more time for me to spend on analysis. His eyes glittered when he finally found the slides he were looking for. There have been some developments about the Swordish Wren losing further value today. We have been trying to stabilize it with the central bank. The recession of 51 put enormous pressure on the economy, resulting in the collapse of the value of our currency. The entire situation was a significant cause of concern for our administration. Since economics is your forte, Mr. Rain, it is possible that you might already be aware of the data. I can still explain the current economic situation in better detail. What is our GDP and debt situation? Our GDP is 310 billion Swordish Ren and the national debt is 427 billion. It's still hard to fathom that we lost nearly 150 billion in wealth the past three years or tough. What is our unemployment and inflation rate? Unemployment has skyrocketed and is now at a staggering 16% and the inflation is at a relative high of 7%. Unemployment is increasing crime and drug use. We need to get people off the streets. The inflation isn't helping our average citizens either. What is the status of the recession? The economy has been in recession of about negative 6% the past year. The average GDP has dropped from Swedish Ren 15,454 per capita to Swedish Ren 10,359 from 1951 to now. This administration's success depends on our ability to stop the recession. The sooner we can reach GDP growth, the better. I have all the information needed. Let's move on to the economic strategy.
Simon scattered the paper stack in front of him in an orderly manner and took a final look at his notes before clearing his throat. As you can see, the situation is alarming, but not everything is negative. The extensive pri words, the extensive privatization program of Alfonso left us a large budget surplus which we can use to stabilize the crisis. The primary subject we need to settle is on what general path we will take in our term. Salonomic space nationalization happened in the 30s and Alfonso's privatization began during the end of the 40s. What will our administration focus on? One of our main promises was to promote a free market economy to stop the recession. To be frank, I believe it is the only way out of the recession. I still do not support it. Why promote the private sector when we have qualified state-owned enterprises? Because the lack of competition has made them inefficient. Simon nodded. Humanity in the 20th century is thriving because of the rule of supply and demand. Agreed. Look at how quickly Lesbia and Arcasia have increased their prosperity by embracing these basic principles. Swordland has a potential to do so as well, why don't we take our potential seriously? Integrating heavily in a market economy would work if we had extensive means of production our industry is lacking. The structural problems of Salam and Axe were going to lead to a recession according to the predictions at the time anyway. Either way, even if we pick one of the doctrines, we retain the option to make economic choices on a case-by-case -case basis. That is, however, not recommended in my point of view. The last thing we need is a chaotic economic plan. Finally, something we can both agree on, Lois. There is another important point which has a direct impact on our economy, superpowers. We might have won the election, but I am still against aligning ourselves with any superpowers. Simon Hall, economically speaking, we are much more closer to Arcasia than United Katana, so a decision to align to the West makes more sense. We must be very cautious. There are schemes being devised about Swordland. We cannot give in to their wants, now or in the future, otherwise our country will turn into a pawn. I want you to reconsider your promise to align with Arcasia. I have made a promise to the people of Swordland I won't back down. Entering the sphere of Arcasia will help boost our economy in many ways they are wealthy and influential. Exactly, I like to think of it as a very valuable partnership with the deals we will we will get by aligning ourselves with a strong country like Arcasia. Recession would surely end in no time. In return for what? Swordland's independence? When the time comes, I hope you will make the right decision for our own good. Simon cleared his throat again. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Minister Whiskey. We'll be in charge of informing you on those types of foreign policy decisions. We must first decide our internal economic plan. Simon put forward a legal document outlining the possibilities with both economic doctrines listed. The cabinet members looked at me. Let's finish what Alfonso started with the capitalist with the capitalist free market reforms, his path was going to enrich Swordland. The recession was a direct result of his free market reforms. History must note that the reason for the recession was because Ewald Alfonso was betrayed by his party. That is not true, there is plenty of time for him to do it. If you can't make change happen in two years, then you are at fault. Would a free market focus bring us stronger allies? It would make Arcasia look at our country in a more positive light. They are a proponent of the free market economy. The influence Arcasia has on the world economy is extensive. Our economic strategy should be based on internal reasoning, so... What's our long-term economic schedule? Picking a construction company, trade relations, tax reform, and privatization initiatives would be some of them. Sticking to a solid planned economy strategy will be the right call. The five-year plans were fruitful in the past. Let's move on. What are your final thoughts then, Mr. President? Critical institutions must remain state controlling, must be fully responsible in delivering services. We should look at opportunities like privatization to create financial resources. A market economy doesn't require as much guidance and could help us attract foreign capital. Especially from Arcasia, President Walker is always interested in expanding the economic zone of ATO. We can secure lucrative investments from capitalist countries. So what will our general economic plan promote? Promote a free market economy as we promised. I can't say that I agree with this. Willis looked displeased. Now that there is clarity on which direction we are heading, I will work on a good plan accordingly. This concludes our meeting. At our next gathering, we will talk about the upcoming infrastructure investment plan. 
Now that the economic direction was taken, the ministers dispersed for lunch at the Maroon Palace. Infrastructure report. The recent collapse of the tourism industry in Lenkrug has led to a reduction in trade traffic and road maintenance. The road network is currently in service, but is in need of substantial improvement. Ports, country roads, and bridges similarly, similarly suffer from a lack of investment. Firms doing business in Lenkrug report a significant shortage of warehousing facilities, particularly refrigerated facilities, with implications both for the transportation system and the ability to serve the population's basic food and health needs. Swordland Today, Economic Meeting Held in Holzer Contacts close to the government report that yesterday, Swordland's economic policies have been planned behind closed doors. Shortly after the meeting, <coughs> Shortly after the meeting that was also attended by President Rain, the Minister of Economy has released a statement regarding their short-term economic plan, which includes the promotion of the free market economy. Freezing temperatures recorded. Nationalist violence. That sounds lovely. Armadine Industries pioneering electronics. Okay. A decision to invest in one of the two planned. Okay, we'll hold off on that. Infrastructure report, recession led to reduction of rail assets. Okay. Promising agricultural growth. For the first time in three years, the, agri the agricultural output of Sarna has increased. Many experts link the increased output to both the drop in temperatures and new farming practices that have been adopted in recent years. Additionally, farmers are now accessing more generous credit allowances from the government that were left over from the Alfonso administration. The Ministry of Agriculture reports that the region's agricultural industry has the potential to become a powerhouse in the future if investments persist. We are promoting a market economy system and advising businesses to shift towards this goal. Increasing unemployment. Uh, the change in economic conditions is historic and stunning in its speed, said the mayor of Morna. In the aftermath of the crisis of 1951, the unemployment rate in Morna rose to 9% the following year. The last six months have also erased all gains in employment over the last two decades. <coughs> the Minister of Economy has put forward two bold plans for mega infrastructure projects that would help with the economic recession in the long term. Investing in projects of this scale will take up some portion of our budget but could prove worthwhile if accomplished successfully. The view towards the Markian Sea from Lockman was nothing short of exquisite. The seaside state residence fittingly named the Blue Mansion was large, fine, and accommodating. But enjoying the luxurious mansion wasn't the main reason of our visit. We gathered the economic team here to discuss the new infrastructure investment project. Half an hour had already passed since the start of the meeting. Unfortunately, I did not even have the chance to have my usual afternoon coffee. Looking at the view from the window, I let my mind drift for a couple of seconds. Simon's voice brought me back into the ongoing discussion. Mr. President, we need to focus on boosting the economy as quickly as possible. One of the fastest ways to achieve this is through infrastructure projects. What can we focus on? On the one hand, businessmen are complaining about the slow logistical rail network between Holzard and Lockven. Lois started talking as soon as Simon took a breath. On the other hand, citizens and criticize Citizens are criticizing the lack of a proper highway connection between Lockman and Arbury. The narrow roads by the seaside are not only dangerous, but also difficult to traverse. We need to pick the most profitable option for the economic growth, which is obviously connecting our two most economical, powerful cities. It is not the business people that suffer, but the ordinary folk. What really matters, though, is that we can accomplish something tangible in your first economic act. We must prove our administration's capabilities. People must know that this administration can get things done. Therefore, I define two important projects for your attention. The H3 Highway Project and the L1 High Speed Railway Project. Mr. Holroy positioned himself on the chair to take...
Mr. Hall repositioned himself on the chair to take a more comfortable posture. The ministry can only support one project at a time with the current capacity and budget. Let's move on to the details of each. So which one do you want to hear about first? The H3 Highway Project. The H3 Highway Project aims to improve the abysmal state of the road network in the Agnoland region bordering Agnolia. The area is home to several million Agnosordish and Sordish people and Sordish who feel neglected. <clears throat> There are no proper highway connections to and from Agland. The mayor of Arbury, Eric Neal, has been asking for a bigger budget to develop the regional infrastructure. He told us that even trucks are having a hard time traveling through the main roads. The increased traffic is causing trouble for people commuting in and out of the region. I agree this could also hurt the local businesses. It is. Bless their soul. I'm sure we're thinking alike on the matter. Let's look at the map. Look at the map. I looked at the map, but was just pointing out Lockfin. The H3, the H3 highway route starts at here and leads to Len Krug. From there it goes all the way to Arvory. As a result, the road network towards the Agnolian capital, Stallport, will improve substantially. She paused and leaned forward in her chair. I saw the central government continuously neglect the Agnosordish dominated regions when I was mayor. Is this administration going to continue that kind of negligence? We should no longer neglect a key region for our trade with Agnolia. Yes, sure, but most goods flow to Lockfin and Holsard, which give importance to logistics there. It has to be pointed out that the highway would be less beneficial in the near term. I have to disagree, it will increase the speed of transportation throughout the region. Our citizens will be quite pleased if we successfully accomplish this. Besides, if we went to trade talks with Agnolia, they would see the investment as a positive sign. I have settled on a decision. Excellent. What will your final choice be, Mr. President? I have decided on the H3 Highway project to improve the infrastructure in our poorer regions. Thank God, I knew that you would see reason. The negotiations will begin in the middle of this year. You will be able to award the contract to a corporation of your choice. The ministry estimates that the entire construction will finish in two years if every step going forward is executed successfully. Thank you all for your contributions and thoughts. Good. Is there anything else? This should be all, Mr. President. See you soon, Mr. Rain. Have a nice day, Mr. President. An opportunity to buy stocks from an Arcasian company. Personal investment opportunity has been relayed by Mr. Magner. An experienced stockbroker and inventor say Arcasia is selling valuable shares of Armadine Industries, an up and coming electronics manufacturing company. We could invest or let the opportunity pass. I'm only going to buy a thousand shares. And it's time for the inaugural ball. I had just finished binding up my suit jacket when the doorbell rang. The presidential guard had arrived to pick us up for the inaugural ball. The ball was a three decade old tradition, breathlessly anticipated by politicians, bureaucrats, and the press. All eyes were about to be on me. I called Monica to get the children ready, looking in the mirror, I strained my tie and took a deep breath. After tonight, there would be no turning back. Suddenly, Deanna hugged me from behind, startling me a little. Monica had fixed her hair into an elaborate braid woven through with ribbons. Papa! Mama told me it's time to go! Stroke her hair. I stroked her hair. Someday I'll have to pry the boys away from you. Papa, don't be gross, she giggled. It was almost time to leave. The big ball was starting in less than an hour. Now where's my first lady? Monica came down the stairs. She was wearing a simple yet elegant beige sheathed dress and short heels. Her hair had been neatly pinned into a chignon, showing off the pearl earrings I had given her for our 15th anniversary.
All those years, she had stayed by my side. Now we were about to begin the most challenging chapter in our lives yet. How do you do, Mr. President? She extended a gloved hand and I raised it to my lips. Monica, my love, you look as gorgeous as the day we married. There's that charm that got you elected. Frank trudged down the stairs. This thing itches. Frank tugged at the collar of his new tuxedo. He seemed ill at ease. Are you good to go, Frank? Yes, the sooner we go, the sooner it'll be over, right? Papa, are these people going to be around us from now on? She pointed at the presidential guards at the door of the house. These people are our friends, Deanna. It's alright, baby. They're here to make sure nothing bad happens to your papa or his family. Monica held Deanna's hand together. Blanked by the guards, we walked out of the door. Halfway to the car, Frank stopped abruptly and turned towards me. Dad, do I really have to go? Can I stay home instead? You'll love it, son. I'm sure there'll be plenty of pretty girls to dance with. So there's even time in between all the boring speeches, but I guess I have no choice. Got that over with, Frank. Let's go. The car is waiting for us. The presidential guard showed us the way as a red and blue as red and blue lights flashed around us. Sergey, my driver, ushered us into our armored limousine. The motorcade started moving towards the palace. I gazed out the window, deep in thought. Anton, what are you thinking about? I was thinking we've come a long way together, haven't we? Yes, we have, and there's still so much that we'll accomplish side by side. Just remember, no matter what happens, the children and I will always be here for you. I'm going to help Papa fix everything. Frank rolled his eyes. Monica, I know you will, honey. We'll see, darling. After what seemed like just a few minutes, the convoy slowed to a halt. Sergey rolled down the limousine's soundproof partition. Sergey Wolkner, we are here, sir. Hope you enjoyed the drive. Much appreciated. How are you today, Sergey? I am just as good as I can be, but today is your day, sir. I'm glad you are in charge now. You know, my entire family voted for you. Thank you and your family. I am here with all of your support. No reason to thank me, sir. You are the one who sparked a glimmer of hope in us all. Sergey opened the door for me. The normally imposing palace was festooned with Garrett garish banners that nearly made it look cheerful. A line of shiny luxury sedans stretched around it. Politicians, bureaucrats, and celebrities, the creme de la creme of the Swordland elite, streamed inside the building. Good luck out there, Mr. President. I'll see you on the trip home. I stepped down and immediately found myself surrounded by loud voices and camera flashes. Hordes of eager journalists thrust their portable microphones my way. My guards fended most of them off, but one woman managed to dodge them and cornered me. I recognized the Swordish Broadcasting Company logo on her press lander. Mr. President, Mr. President, do you plan on working together with the opposition parties on the expected constitutional reforms? We are going to work with everybody. Mr. Richter clarified that as long as you hold your promises of democratization, they will support you on these issues to the end. What do you think about this statement? I welcome it. This is a challenge for us all. One more question. One of your first acts as president was to veto a campaign finance law that would have deprived small parties of public funds while increasing those channeled to your own. Are we seeing the beginning of a more egalitarian administration? Yes, no political party deserves to be silenced. That's enough, ma'am, said one of my guards while nudging the reporter away from me. A path through the crowd was now open, and we quickly made our way to the entrance of the palace at the same time. A dozen fireworks went off. The entrance was decorated with beautiful ribbons and swordless colors of white, yellow, and maroon. A lush, a lush maroon carpet had been rolled down the stairs. We entered the lobby and joined the throngs of people making their way towards the ballroom. Behind me, I heard a familiar voice. Peter Vectrin. There they are, the most beautiful family in Swordland. Uncle Peter! Hi, Uncle Peter. It's great to see you. You two are growing faster than I am getting wiser. You're a sight for sore eyes, Peter. Are you sure you've gotten any wiser, Peter? 
maybe not after all i'm still sticking with you <laughs> happy to see a familiar face peter evelyn peter's wife evelyn approached us and shook our hands with a firmness that uh belied her delicate features congratulations anton anton i have to say the results were clear to me from the beginning There's a woman behind every successful man. What a gentleman. Monica smiled at me. Monica, how are you? You've barely said a word. I'm more than relieved to have this roller coaster ride over with, but of course now the real work begins. Ah yes, managing the help, planning parties, daily trips to the salon to look your best for foreign dignitaries. Don't be so old fashioned, Evelyn. I plan to use my powers as first lady to advance the position of women's of women throughout Swordland. Equal rights for our sex are long overdue, wouldn't you say, Anton? Absolutely, and we'll work together to achieve that. Monica flashed a smile. Diana suddenly jumped in between us and tugged on my sleeve. Papa, can we go in? I want to see the ballroom. Of course, darling. Let's not delay any longer. We left the lobby and made our way towards the ballroom. Inside, we were yet again surrounded by a noisy crowd, but this time it was the politicians who sought to appease the new authority in Swordland. I spent the next few hours shaking hands, joining various conversations, some serious, some superficial, and making speeches. We finally settled down at our dinner table with the veterans as the band started playing some slow jazz tunes. Oof, that was tiring. What, you're already tired? Well... Suddenly a loud banging noise echoed from outside the ballroom, then another one, and another. The musicians stopped playing, everyone in the room was looking around in confusion. Peter and I turned towards each other, realization dawning on both of our faces. Fireworks? No! Gunshots! As soon as Monica heard the words, she lunged from her seat. I threw myself on Monica, Deanna, and Frank to shield them. Papa, what's happening? I knew. I knew it. You never should have gone. Chaos broke out as some guests flung themselves under their tables and others ran towards the door, screaming. Deanna burst into tears while Frank tried to comfort her, hiding the fear in his own eyes. Three more gunshots rang out loudly. Mr. President, are you alright? Carl Geiser, head of the Swordish Police Force, was running towards us with three more police officers in decorated uniforms. They all had their guns drawn. As soon as he made it to us and saw that we were unharmed, he let out a big sigh of relief. Thank God. Check the perimeter. He turned around quickly to his men. Check the perimeter. Now! Paul, Jensen, follow my lead. We'll bring them to the safe room. He now turned to Monica, Evelyn, and the children and spoke in a softer voice. Do not worry. The situation is now under control. Please follow me. He promptly followed Carl through the winding halls and corridors of the palace. His men still had their guns drawn, which did nothing to ease the tension on the way. Peter made an attempt to break the silence. What a fucking night. Shh, not now, Peter. Carl turned to us with a serious face as we were about to run the corner. Quiet, please. Sorry, I talk when I get nervous. Peter, shut up! Carl flipped a switch on the wall and a panel opened, revealing a hidden staircase leading to a large reinforced door. Inside, a set of emergency lights flickered on. The safe room was comfortable and spacious, with expensive-looking leather sofas. Small security monitors on the wall displayed grainy footage of each room in the palace. There was a boardroom and a pantry containing enough provisions to last us months. Monica and Evelyn sat the children down and started wiping their tears. Carl stepped away from us and made a few radio calls. When he was done, he returned to me and Peter. So what's the status? Carl's radio suddenly crackled to life. Every second felt like an eternity as he pressed his ear to the receiver. When it fell silent, he turned to us. Good news, we are not in any danger at the moment. The situation has been dealt with, and the perimeter has been secured by the guards and the police. He glanced towards Monica, Evelyn, and the kids. If I may, sir. He gestured towards a more private corner of the room and started... And, and starting speaking more quietly started is what it was supposed to say this is what we know so far we have confirmed that two people were gunned down in front of the palace the attacker is one of them and we have reason to believe he was working on he fired three shots at an mp one to the head two to the body instantly killing him presidential guards at the palace immediately shot and killed the attacker he has not been identified yet and will require an investigation 
The NP that was killed was identified as Bernard Sirkos. This is huge, Anton. This will cause a lot of problems. A lot of problems. Peter pulled out two cigarettes and handed me one. He then turned to Evelyn. I could hear him trying to reassure her that everything was going to be alright. Monica was still trying to tend to Diana and Frank, paced the room, mumbling that he shouldn't have come. I sat down beside my wife and children. We are safe. I'll make sure everything is going to be fine. I can't be sure of anything anymore, Anton. I lit my cigarette and took a deep drag. I was willing to see this through and keep my family safe at all costs. I crushed the cigarette on the ashtray. Dun dun dun! President Rain gave signals about a cooperation with front director of the PFJP ahead of the inauguration ball. Going the remarks of Richter about a possible cooperation to fix current problems of Swordish political institutions, I welcome it. This is a problem of us all, said President Rain. Richter has long been vocal about his democratization plans, but maybe his demands for constitutional change might finally become a reality if President Rain leads a bill together with Richter's PFJP. MP shot nation in shock. Sorlin has been shocked by grave news today as an elected member of parliament has been shot dead in a suspected political assassination. Police sirens were heard around the clock today as the Holzer police force increased security measures around the capital. The fact that such a violent act happened at the heart of the capital during the present during the new president's inauguration celebration has worried many citizens. The ready youth is reported to have promised revenge. This seems like it has the potential to be a spark that would swirl that would that would swirl Swordland into the political violence of the 1920s. Well, this has gone on for an hour and 22 minutes. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to smash that like button. Comment down below if you'd like to see more. And if you enjoy the content, subscribe. Y'all have a great rest of your day.
I'll see you in the next one.